Chapter 4. We have to go up on wiring fatigue. The motor lorries roll up after dark. We climb in. It is a warm evening and the twilight seems like a canopy under whose shelter we feel drawn together. Even the stingy Chodden gives me a cigarette and then a light. We stand jammed in together shoulder to shoulder. There is no room to sit, but we do not expect that. Mueller is in a good mood for once. He's wearing his new boots. The engines drone, the lorries bump and rattle, the roads are worn and full of holes. We dare not show a light, so we lurch along and are often almost pitched out. That does not worry us, however, it can happen if it likes. A broken arm is better than a hole in the guts, and many a man would be thankful enough for such a chance of finding his way home again. Beside us stream the munition columns in long files. They are making the pace. They overtake us continually. We joke with them and they answer back. A wall becomes visible. It belongs to a house which lies on the side of the road. I suddenly prick up my ears. Am I deceived? Again I hear distinctly the cackle of geese. A glance at Kaczynski. A glance from him to me. We understand one another. Cat, I hear some aspirants over the frying pan over there. He nods. It will be attended to when we come back. I have their number. Of course Cat has their number. He knows all about every leg of goose within a radius of 15 miles. The lorries arrive at the artillery lines. The gun emplacements are camouflaged with bushes against aerial observation and look like a kind of military feast of the tabernacles. These branches might seem gay and cheerful were not cannon embowered there. The air becomes acrid with the smoke of the guns in the, in the fog. The fumes of powder taste bitter on the tongue. The roar of the guns makes our lorry stagger. The reverberation rolls raging away to the rear. Everything quakes. Our faces change imperceptibly. We are not indeed in the front line, but only in the reserves. Yet in every face can be read, this is the front. Now we are within its embrace. It's not fear. Men who have been up as often as we have become thick-skinned. Only the young recruits are agitated. Cat explains to them, that was a 12-inch. You can tell by the report. Now you hear the burst. But the muffled thud of the burst does not reach us. It is swallowed up in the general murmur of the front. Cat listens. There'll be a bombardment tonight. We all listen. The front is restless. The Tommies are firing already, says Crop. The shelling can be heard distinctly. It is the English batteries to the right of our section. They are beginning an hour too soon. According to us, they start punctually at 10 o'clock. What's got them, says Mueller? Their clocks must be fast. There'll be a bombardment, I tell you. I can feel it in my bones, Cat shrugs his shoulders. Three guns open fire close beside us. The burst of flame shoots across the fog. The guns roar and boom. We shiver and are glad to think that we shall be back in the huts early in the morning. Our faces are neither paler nor more flushed than usual. They are not more tense nor more flabby, and yet they are changed. We feel that in our blood a contact has shot home. That is no figure of speech. It is fact. It is the front, the consciousness of the front, that makes this contact. The moment that the first shells whistle over and the air is rent with the explosions, there is suddenly in our veins, in our hands, in our eyes, a tense waiting, a watching, a heightening alertness, a strange sharpening of the senses. The body with one bound is in full readiness. It often seems to me as though it were the vibrating, shuddering air that with a noiseless leap springs upon us, or as though the front itself emitted an electric current which awakened unknown nerve centers. Every time, it's the same. We start out for the front plain, plain soldiers, either cheerfully or gloomy. <clears throat> then come the first gun emplacements, and every word of our speech has a new ring. When Cat stands in front of the hut and says, There'll be a bombardment? That is merely his own opinion. But if he says it here, then the sentence has the sharpness of a bayonet in the moonlight. It cuts clean through the thought. It thrusts near and speaks to this unknown thing that is awakened in us. A dark meaning. There'll be a bombardment. Perhaps it is our inner and most secret life that shivers and falls on guard. To me, the front is a mysterious whirlpool. Though I'm in still water far away from its center, I feel the whirl of the vortex sucking me slowly, irresistibly, inescapable into itself. From the earth, from the air, sustaining forces pour into us, mostly from the earth. To no man does the earth mean so much as to the soldier. When he presses himself down upon her long and powerfully, when he buries his face and his limbs deep in her from the fear of death by shellfire, 
Then she is his only friend, his brother, his mother. He stifles his terror and his cries in her silence and her security. She shelters him and releases him for ten seconds to live, to run, ten seconds of life. Receives him again and often, forever. Earth, earth, earth. Earth with thy folds and hollows and holes into which a man may fling himself and crouch down in the spasm of terror under the hailing of annihilation, in the bellowing death of explosions. O earth, thou grantest us the great resisting surge of new one life. Our being, almost utterly carried away by the fury of the storm, streams back through our hands from thee, and we, thy redeemed ones, bury ourselves in thee, and though the long minutes in a mute agony of hope bite into thee with our lips. At the sound of the first droning of the shells we rush back, in one part of our being a thousand years, by the animal instinct that is awakened in us, we are led and protected. It is not conscious, it is far quicker, much more sure, less valuable than consciousness. One cannot explain it. A man is walking along without thought or heed. Suddenly he throws himself down on the ground, and a storm of fragments flies harmlessly over him. Yet he cannot remember either to have heard the shell coming or to have thought of flinging himself down. But he had, had he not abandoned himself to the impulse, he would now be a heap of mingled flesh. It is this other, the second sight in us, that has thrown us to the ground and saved us without our knowing how. If it were not so, there would not be one man alive from Flanders to the Vosage. We march up, moody or good-tempered soldiers, we reach the zone where the front begins and becomes and become on the instant human animals. An indignant looking wood receives us. We pass by the soup kitchens, under cover of the wood we climb out. The lorries turn back. They are to collect us again in the morning before dawn. Mist and the smoke of guns lie breast high over the fields. The moon is shining. Along the road, troops file. Their helmets gleam softly in the moonlight. The heads and the rifles stand out above the white mist, nodding heads, rocking barrels. Farther on the mist ends, here the head becomes figures, coats, trousers, and boots appear out of the mist as from a milky pool. They become a column, the column marches on, straight ahead, the figures resolve themselves into a block, individuals are no longer re recognizable, the dark wedge presses onward, fantastically topped by the heads, and the weapons floating on the milky pool, a column, not men at all. Guns and munition wagons are moving along a cross road. The backs of the horses shine in the moonlight. The movements are beautiful. They toss their heads and their eyes gleam. The guns and the wagons float past the dim background of the moonlit landscape. The ridders in their steel helmet resemble knights of a forgotten time. It is strangely beautiful and arresting. We push on to the pioneer dump. Some of us load our shoulders with pointed and twisted iron stakes. Others thrust smooth iron rods through rolls of wire and go off with them. The burdens are awkward and heavy. The ground becomes more broken. From ahead come warnings. Look out! Deep shell hole on the left! Mine trenches! Our eyes peer out. Our feet and our sticks feel in front of us before they take the weight of the body. Suddenly the line halts. I bump my face against the roll of wire carried by the man in front and curse. There are some shell smashed lorries in the road. Another order. Cigarettes and pipes out! We are near the line. In the meantime, it has become pitch dark. We skirt a small wood and then have the front line immediately before us. An uncertain red glow spreads along the skyline from one to the other. It is in perpetual movement, punctuated with the burst of flame from the nozzles of the batteries. Balls of light rise up high above it, silver and red spheres which explode and rain down in showers of red, white, and green stars. French rockets go up, which unfold a sick parachute. To the air and drift slowly down they light up everything as bright as day their light shines on us and we see our shadows sharply outlined on the ground they hover for the space of a minute before they burn out immediately fresh ones shoot up in the sky and again green red and blue stars bombardment says cat the thunder of the guns swells to a single heavy roar and then breaks up again into separate explosions the dry bursts of the machine guns rattle above us the air teems with invisible swift movement howls pipings and hisses there are smaller shells and amongst them booming through the night like an organ go the great coal boxes and the heavies they have a they have a horse distant bellow like a running stag and make their way high above the howl and whistle of the smaller shells 
It reminds me of flocks of wild geese when I hear them. Last autumn, the wild geese flew day after day across the path of the shells. The searchlights begin to sweep the dark sky. They slide along it like gigantic tapering rulers. One of them pauses and quivers a little. Immediately, a second is beside him. A black insect is caught between them and tries to escape the airman. He hesitates, is blinded, and falls. At regular intervals, we ram in the iron stakes. Two men hold a roll and the others spool off the barbed wire. It is that awful stuff with close set, long spikes. I'm not used to unrolling it and I tear my hand. After a few hours, it is done. But there is still some time before the lorries come. Most of us lie down and sleep. I try also, but it has turned too chilly. We know we are not far from the sea because we are constantly waked by the cold. Once I fall fast asleep, then awakening suddenly with a start, I do not know where I am. I see the stars, I see the rockets, and for a moment have the impression that I have fallen asleep at a garden fete. I don't know whether it is morning or evening. I lie in the pale cradle of the twilight and listen for soft words, which will come soft and near. Am I crying? I put my hand to my eyes. It is so fantastic. Am I a child? Smooth skin? It lasts only a second. Then I recognize the silhouette of Kaczynski. The old veteran, he sits quietly and smokes his pipe. A covered pipe, of course. When he sees I am awake, he says, That gave you a fright. It was only a nose cap. It landed in the bushes over there. I sit up. I feel myself strangely alone. It's good cat is there. He gazes thoughtfully at the front and says, Mighty fine fireworks if they weren't so dangerous. One lands behind us. Some recruits jump up terrified. A couple of minutes later, another comes over. Nearer this time, Cat knocks out his pipe. We're in for it. Then it begins in earnest. We crawl away as well as we can in our haste. The next lands fair amongst us. Two fellows cry out. Green rockets shoot up on the skyline. Barrage! The mud flies high. Fragments whiz past. The crack of the guns is heard long after the roar of the explosions. Besides us lies a fair-headed recruit in utter terror. He has buried his face in his hands. His helmet has fallen off. I fish hold of it and try to put it put it back on his his head. He looks up, pushes the helmet off, and like a child creeps under my arm. His head close to my breast. The little shoulders heave. Shoulders just like Kemrick's. I let him be so that the helmet should be of some use. I stick it on his behind. Not for jest, but out of consideration, since that is his highest part. And though there is plenty of meat there, a shot in it can be damned painful. Besides, a man has to lie for months on his belly in the hospital, and afterwards he would be almost sure to have a limp. It's got someone pretty badly, cries are heard between the explosions. At last it grows quiet. The fire is lifted over us and is now dropping on the reserves. We risk a look. Red rockets shoot up to the sky. Apparently there's an attack coming. Where we are, it is still quiet. I sit up and shake the recruit by the shoulder. All over, kid. It's all the right this time. It's all right this time. He looks round him dazedly. You'll get used to it soon, I tell him. He sees his helmet and puts it on. Gradually he comes to. Then suddenly he turns fiery red and looks confused. Cautiously he reaches his hand to his behind and looks at me dismally. I understand at once. Gun shy. That wasn't the reason I had stuck his helmet over it. That's no disgrace, I reassure him. Many's the man before you has had his pants full after the first bombardment. Go behind that bush there and throw your underpants away. Get along. He goes off. Things become quieter. The cries do not cease. What's up, Albert, I ask. A couple of columns over there got it in the neck. The cries continued. It is not men. They could not cry so terribly. Wounded horses, says Cat. It's unendurable. It is the moaning of the world. It is the martyred creation, wild with anguish, filled with terror and groaning. We are pale. Dietering stands up. God! For God's sake, shoot them! He is a farmer and very fond of horses. It gets under his skin. Then, as if deliberately the fire dies down again, the screaming of the beasts become louder. One can no longer distinguish, hence in this now quiet silvery landscape, it comes, ghostly, invisible. It is everywhere between heaven and earth. It rolls on immeasurably. Deedering raves and yells out, Shoot them! Shoot them! Can't you damn you again? They must look after the men first, says Cat quietly. We stand up and try to see where it is. If we could only see the animals, we should be able to endure it better. Mueller has a pair of glasses. We see a dark group, bearers with stretchers, and large black clumps moving about. Those are the wounded horses, but not all of them. 
Some gallop away in the distance, fall down, and then run on farther. The belly of one is ripped open. The guts trail out. He becomes tangled in them and then falls. Then he stands up again. Dietering raises up his gun and aims. Cat hits it in the air. Are you mad? Dietering trembles and throws his rifle on the ground. We sit down and, and hold our ears, but this appalling noise, these groans and screams penetrate. They penetrate everywhere. We can bear almost anything, but now the sweat breaks out on us. We must get up and run no matter where, but where these cries can no longer be heard, and it is not men, only horses. From the dark group, stretchers move off again, then single shots crack out. The black heap convulses and then sinks down at last, but still, it is not the end. The men cannot overtake the wounded beasts which fly in their pain, their wide open mouths full of anguish. One of the men goes down on one knee, a shot. One horse drops, another. The last one props itself on its forelegs and drags itself round in a circle like a merry-go-round, squatting. It drags round in circles on its stiffened forelegs. Apparently, its back is broken. The soldier runs up and shoots it. Slowly, humbly, it sinks to the ground. We take our hands from our ears. The cries are silenced. Only a long, drawn, dying sigh still hangs on the air. Then, only again, the rockets, the singing of shells, and the stars there. Most strange. Diedering walks up and down, cursing. Like to know what harm they've done. He returns to it once again. His voice is agitated. It sounds almost dignified as he says, I tell you, it's the vilest baseness to use horses in the war. We go back. It is time we return to the lorries. The sky has become brighter. Three o'clock in the morning. The breeze is fresh and cool. The pale hour makes our faces look gray. We trudge onward in single file through the trenches and shell holes and come again to the zone of mist. Kaczynski is restive. That's a bad sign. What's up, cat? says Crop. I wish I were back home. Home. He means the huts. We'll soon be out of it, cat. He's nervous. I don't know. I don't know. We come to the communication trench and then to the open fields. The little wood reappears. We know every foot of ground here. There's the cemetery with the mounds and the black crosses. That moment it breaks out behind us, swells, roars, and thunders. We duck down. A cloud of flame shoots up a hundred yards ahead of us. The next minute, under a second explosion, part of the wood rises slowly in the air. Three or four trees sail up and then crash to pieces. The shells begin to hiss like safety valves. Heavy fire! Take cover! Yells somebody, cover! The fields are flat. The wood is too distant and dangerous. The only cover is the graveyard and the mounds. We stumble across in the dark, and as though he had been spat there, every man lies glued behind a mound. Not a moment too soon. The dark goes mad. It heaves and raves. Darknesses. Darknesses blacker than the night rush on us, like with giant strides. Over us and away, the flames of the explosions light up the graveyard. There's no escape anywhere. By the light of the shells, I try to get a view of the fields. There are a surging sea. Daggers of flame from the explosions leap up like fountains. It's impossible for anyone to break through it. The wood vanishes. It is pounded, crushed, torn to pieces. We must stay here in the graveyard. The earth bursts before us. The rain, it rains clouds. Sorry, clods. I feel a smack. My sleeve is torn away by a splinter. I shut my fist. No pain. Still, that does not reassure me. Wounds won't hurt till afterwards. I feel the arm all over it. It is grazed but sound. Now a crack on the skull. I begin to lose consciousness. Like lightning, the thought comes to me. Don't faint. I sink down in the black broth and immediately come up to the top again. A splinter slashes into my helmet, but has already traveled so far that it does not go through. I wipe the mud out of my eyes. A hole is torn up in front of me. Shells hardly ever land in the same hole twice. I'll get into it. With one lunge, I shoot as flat as a fish over the ground. There it whistles again. Quickly, I crouch together, claw for cover. Feel something on the left. Shove in beside it. It gives way. I groan. The earth leaps. The blast thunders in my ears. I creep under the yielding thing. Cover myself with it. Draw it over me. It is wood. Cloth. Cover. Cover. Miserable. Cover. Against the whizzing splinters. I open my eyes. My fingers grasp a sleeve and arm. A wounded man? I yell to him. No answer. A dead man. My hand gropes farther. Splinters of wood. Now I remember again that we are lying in the graveyard. But the shelling is stronger than everything. It wipes out the sensibilities. I merely crawl still farther under the coffin. It shall protect me. Though death himself lies in it. Before me gapes the shell hole. 
I grasp it with my eyes as with fists. With one leap, I must be in it. There, I get a smack in the face. A hand clamps onto my shoulder. Has the dead man waked up? The hand shakes me. I turn my head. In the second of light, I stare into the face of Kaczynski. He has his mouth wide open and is yelling. I hear nothing. He rattles me. Comes nearer. In a momentary lull, his voice reaches me. Gas! 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 Pass it on! I grab for my gas mask. Some distance from me there lies someone. I think of nothing but this. That fellow there must know. Gas! Gas! I call. I lean toward him. I swipe at him with the satchel. He doesn't see. Once again, again he merely ducks. It's a recruit. I look at Cat desperately. He has his mask on. I pull out mine too. My helmet falls to one side. It slips over my face. I reach the man. His satchel is on the side nearest me. I seize the mask. Pull it over his head. He understands. I let go and with a jump drop into, a, into the shell hole. The dull thud of the gas shells mingles with the crashes of the light explosives. A bell sounds between the explosions. Gongs and metal clappers warning everyone. Gas, gas, gas. Someone plumps down behind me. Another. I wipe the goggles of my mask clear of the moist breath. It's cat. Crop. Someone else. All four of us lie there in a heavy, watchful suspense and breathe as lightly as possible. These first minutes with the mask decide between life and death. Is it airtight? I remember the awful sights in the hospital, the gas patients who in day-long suffocation cough up their burnt lungs in clots. Cautiously, the mouth applied to the valve, I breathe. The gas still creeps over the ground and sinks into all hallows like a big, soft jellyfish. It floats into our shell hole and lolls there obscenely. I nudge Cat. It's better to crawl out and lie on top than to stay where the gas collects most, but we don't get as far as that. The second bombardment begins. It is no longer as though shells roared. It is the earth itself raging. With a crash, something black bears down on us. It lands close beside us, a coffin thrown up. I see Cat move and I crawl across. The coffin has hit the fourth man in our hole. On its outstretched arm, he tries to tear off his gas mask with the other hand. Crop seizes him just in time, twists the hand sharply behind his back and holds it fast. Cat and I proceed to free the wounded arm. The coffin lid is loose and bursts open. We are easily able to pull it off. We toss the corpse out. It slides down to the bottom of the shell hole. Then we try to loosen the under part. Fortunately, the man swoons and Crop is able to help us. We no longer have to be careful, but work away till the coffin gives with a sigh before the spade that we have dug in under it. It's grown lighter. Cat takes a piece of the lid, places it under the shattered arm, and we wrap all our bandages round it. For the moment, we can do no more. Inside the gas mask, my head booms and roars. It is nigh bursting. My lungs are tight. They breathe always the same hot, used-up air. The veins on my temples are swollen. I feel I am suffocating. A gray light filters through us, through to us. I climb out over the edge of the shell hole. In the dirty twilight lies a leg torn clean off. The boot is quite whole. I take that all in a, at a glance. Now something stands up a few yards distant. I polish the windows. In my excitement, they are immediately dimmed again. I peer through them. A man there no longer wears his mask. I wait some seconds. He has not collapsed. He looks around and makes a few paces. Rattling in my throat, I tear my mask off too and fall down. The air streams into me like cold water. My eyes are bursting. The wave sweeps over me and extinguishes me. The shelling has ceased. I turn towards the crater, beckoning to the others. They take off their masks. We lift up the wounded man, one taking a splintered arm, and so we stumble off hastily. The graveyard is a mass of wreckage. Coffins and corpses lie strewn about. They have been killed once again, but each of them that has flung up saved one of us. The hedge is destroyed. The rails of the light railway are torn up and rise stiffly in the air. In great arches, someone lies in front of us. We stop. Crop goes on alone with the wounded man. The man on the ground is a recruit. His hip is covered with blood. He is so exhausted I feel for my water bottle where I have rum and tea. Cat restraints my hand and stoops over him. Where's it got you, comrade? His eyes move. He is too weak to answer. We slit open his trousers carefully. He groans gently, gently. It is much better. If he has been hit in the stomach, he oughtn't to drink anything. There's no vomiting. That's a good sign. We lay, lay the hip bare. It is one mass of mincemeat and bone splinters. The joint has been hit. This lad won't walk anymore. I wet his temples with a moistened finger and give him a swig. His eyes move again. 
We see now that the right arm is bleeding as well. Cat spreads out two wads of dressing as wide as possible so that they will cover the wound. I look for something to bind loosely round it. We have nothing more, so I slip up the wounded man's trouser legs still farther in order to use a piece of his underpants as a bandage. But he's wearing none. I now look at him closely. He's the fair-headed boy a little while ago. In the meantime, Cat has taken a bandage from a dead man's pocket, and we carefully bind the wound. I say to the youngster, who looks at us fixedly, We're going for a stretcher now. Then he opens his mouth and whispers, Stay here. We'll be back again soon, says Cat. We're only going to get a stretcher for you. We don't know if he understands. He whimpers like a child and plucks at us. Don't go away! Cat looks around and whispers, Shouldn't we just take a revolver and put an end to it? The youngster will hardly survive the carrying, and at the most he will only last a few days. What he has gone through so far is nothing to what he's in for till he dies. Now he is numb and feels nothing. In an hour he will become one screaming bundle of intolerable pain. Every day that he can live will be a howling torture. And to whom does it matter whether he has them or not? I nod. Yes, Cat. We ought to put him out of his misery. He stands still a moment. He has made up his mind. We look round, but we are no longer alone. A little group is gathering from the shell holes and trenches of pure heads. We get a stretcher. Cat shakes his head. Such a kid. He repeats it. Young innocence. Our losses are less than was to be expected. Five killed and eight wounded. It was, in fact, quite a short bombardment. Two of our dead lie in the upturned graves. We merely throw the earth in on them. We go back. We trot off silently in single file, one behind the other. The wounded are taken to the dressing station. The morning is cloudy. The bearers make a fuss about numbers and tickets. The wounded whimper begins to rain. An hour later, we reached our lorries and climb in. There is more room now than there was. The rain becomes heavier. We take out waterproof sheets and spread them over our heads. The rain rattles down and flows off at the sides and streams. The lorries bump through the holes and we rock to and fro in half sleep. Two men in the front of the lorry have long forked poles. They watch for telephone wires which hang crosswise over the road so low that they might easily pull our heads off. The two fellows take them at night at the right moment on their poles and lift them over behind us. We hear their call, Mind wire! Dip the knee in a half sleep and straighten up again. Monotonously, the lorries sway. Monotonously comes the calls. Monotonously falls the rain. It falls on our heads and on the heads of the dead up in the line. And on the body of the little recruit with the wound that is too is so uh, is so much too big for his zip. It falls on Kemrick's grave. It falls in our hearts. An explosion sounds somewhere. We wince. Our eyes become tense. Our hands are ready to vault over the side of the lorry into the ditch by the road. Nothing happens, only the monotonous cry, mind wire, our knees bend, we are again half asleep.